I'm Donald Peralt, and I am here today at the Chester Historical Society's Museum at the Mill. I've been involved with this museum for a number of years, and every time I come here, I'm fascinated by the new things I see and read. But one thing that's in, always interested me from the very moment this museum opened was their exhibit on Native Americans. Why? Because we know so little of these Native Americans. We know so little of their history. And what we do know is very sentimentalized often. So we have to look to the artifacts to learn about them. The Chester Historical Society is a small collection, but it's a good collection. And it can tell us a great deal about these very people that lived in this town we love so much before the English arrived in 1635. One of the books the collection owns is, is, is a wonderful treasure. And this is a book by David Dudley Field, and it's called A Statistical Account of the County of Middlesex in Connecticut in the year 1819. David Dudley Field may not be someone whose name we recognize. Um, he was born in East Guilford, which is today Madison. He was a minister in Haddam, but he had nine children. The second child, I believe, was a representative in the United States House of Reps. Um, he had another son who was a Supreme Court Justice. But the son we know the most was Cyrus Field, who laid the transatlantic cable. In this book, he gives statistics on everything you could possibly imagine in Middlesex County, everything from houses to population to cattle and so forth. But in this book, he talks about Native Americans, Native Americans throughout all of these towns that we know today. He's writing in 1819, which means he talked to people who would have memory of these Native Americans, elderly people in 1819. When he describes the Native Americans in this area, he talks very specifically about there being four groups. Most people today don't even know about these groups. For example, in Westbrook, there was an encampment down today where we know Pilots Point Marina was. That particular um, encampment was often known as Obed's Hammock. Hummock is an old word that probably comes to us from the English meaning home make, where he made his home. Um, you know, very much like a hammock, which actually is a Spanish word. But anyway, um, in this particular case, those Native Americans were ham and acids. There was another group of Native Americans, another encampment of Native Americans that built their home and villages down in what we know today is Indian Town, right across from the old Saybrook High School. These also were probably ham and acids. Over in Ayers Point, which today we know as Otter Cove, was an encampment of Nahantics. And this was the furthest stretch of these Nahantics as they were from Eastern Connecticut. These Nahantics territory went all the way up into what we know today as Deep River, but they mainly lived right at Ayers Point. We all know Ayers Point because that is where David Bushnell in the middle of the night tested his turtle during the American Revolution, which Ben Franklin actually came to see that testing. But the encampment that David Field talks about for us today is a group called the Wangunks or the Wangums. We'll call them the Wangunks for our talk today. We or Chester, as we know it today, was the very southernmost point of these Wangunk Indians. They extended all the way to East Hampton, over to Portland, and as Middletown and above. It was a very large. But Chester was the smallest or the lowest point for them. As a matter of fact, the English actually say that the Pataconk Brook was the southern boundary of the Wangunks. When the English first came into Chester, or what we know as Chester, they didn't call it Chester at the time. The, as a matter of fact, the English called it Pataconk. They took the name that the Indians were using. And when they came into this area, and, and, and my guess is probably were guided by many of the Native Americans in the area, they looked to the Native Americans to try to understand the land. And the Native Americans kept using the term Patacock over and over again. Finally, the English said to them, you know, can you tell us what Patacock is? And for the Patacock, to the Native Americans, it meant a hill and a large hill. And when the English went there, they had to have been amazed by because that very hill is the hill that overlooks the Chester Ferry. Um, and you could, the, in the Society's collection is a beautiful photograph from the early part of the 20th century that shows that hill partially cleared. And you can almost imagine what that hill must have been like as a Native American encampment. If we look to the record, we know that there was a Palisado Fort on top of that hill. And within that Palisado Fort were 
was a longhouse as well as wigwams. And that makes a lot of sense. When you come to the top of that hill today, it's a perfect bend in the river. You can see straight up toward the East Haddam Bridge and you can see straight down toward Deep River. So for these Native Americans living in Cheshire the Wangunks, they were very fearful of the Pequots across the river. And this was an excellent lookout point for them. Patagonk also may mean to the Native Americans was a sweating pit. And the Native Americans had a, had a method of curing sickness using a sweating pit. And we'll talk a little bit about that later toward the end because I think that's an interesting and fascinating uh, piece. And, uh, you know, for the Native Americans, I think for the English, they kind of saw this whole territory as Patacock. The English didn't move into this area until the 1690s. And at that particular point, the Native Americans were still here, even though the English had made treaties with them, defining the boundary between Chester and Haddam at that point. We actually see some of these early records with a chieftain named Sawik, and he actually signed some of these records um, with the English at this particular time. But in order to really understand these Native Americans, we have to look at some of the artifacts. With a lack of an historical record, the best way that we can understand our Native Americans is to look at what they left behind. The Chester Historical Society has these two fine collections of Native American points. But the, and these points tell us a lot, but they only tell us part of the story. We, ha we had to dig into the collection and into the archives for the society to see some of the larger pieces. And let's take a look at what was important for the Native Americans. When we look over here, we can see these, these are items here. These all relate to maize or corn. In this particular case, we see, um, you know, we see the uh, mortars and pestle here. Um, and you can just imagine in this particular case, look at this piece. I mean, it's magnificent. You can see the well-rounded bottom here. You can see the smoothed outside. You can see how well you could grip the piece. And you can just imagine a Native American woman you know, crushing up nuts and so forth. You can just imagine her here. This is the bottom right here. This piece is beautiful. This is the bottom of a much larger soapstone bowl. This stone, a lot of it was quarried in Glastonbury, which probably would have been on the edge of the Wangunk territory. You can imagine this as being a larger bowl and, the, you know, crushing up that corn in there. We can't think of Native American corn as the corn we eat today. That's hybrid corn. They eat very, they have very similar to what we might think of as our Indian corn. Unfortunately, with that corn, you can't eat it right off a cob. They would take it off of there, they would grind it, they would leach out the colors and the impurities, and then they would use it for different things that they would eat, corn cakes, corn mush, and so forth. The society has a beautiful piece that I'm always amazed when I see, and it's this one here. For a lot of us, we wouldn't even know what this is. But you can just imagine with a large handle on it and wrapped on there, and they would have wrapped, uh, you would have used the tendons in a deer, you know, the tendons from the deer's leg to hold it in place. And this is a hoe. This is a garden hoe. And you can just imagine them as they're hoeing their gardens. Now, the Native Americans didn't garden like you and I would think of. They would garden wherever there was an open place available, an open spot. The English constantly talk about coming amongst Connecticut, Massachusetts, they talk about this. They'd be in the middle of the woods, and all of a sudden they'd come to an opening, and there would be Indian corn growing there. The Indian always started their corn in the spring, uh, right when they used to say that the oak leaves were about the size of a, a, a mouse's ear, and they would start them on mounds. They would put fish, dead fish inside that mound, plant the seeds. As the corn started to grow, they would plant pole beans that would grow up amongst the corn stalks. So you can see with the Native Americans, corn was a staple, very important to them. The English talk about it. And as a matter of fact, even for the English, they themselves adopted that corn in no time. We see down at, uh, in, Old Sa in Saybrook, uh, when the English set up their fort there, Lionel Gardner, uh, you know, they're planting corn out in, the, out in the distance. As a matter of fact, that's where Cornfield Point gets its name today, where the English planted their corn and they took it from that spot from the Native Americans. So again, beautiful pieces here. The other thing I like is when I come back to this collection here, where you can see these all of these very small points. Many of these small points were used for hunting, but a number of the very sleek small points you see here would have been used for fishing. 
and they often would just use a small bow and arrow for the fish. But one of the things I've always been fascinated about is the Native Americans used what were called fish wares. And a wear was very similar to a net, and they used these in tidal areas. And what they would do is they would actually, you know, during high tide, they would set these nets into the, into the water, they would be on the surface, they would have nets, wear nets on, I mean, I'm sorry, wear sinkers on them that would actually hold the bottom of the nets down, and then as the tide went out, the fish would be caught behind it. There's no question when you look at the Patacong, what we know today is the Patacong Brook or the creek in Chester, there's no question they had to have used fish wares in there because we, this was the method they used. As a matter of fact, about 20, 15 years ago or so in Old Saybrook on, on um, South Cove, they actually found the remnants of a fish where there. It was a different kind of fish where. It was one more where branches would be poked into the ground, fish would get behind it at high tide, the tide goes out, the fish are trapped behind, and they would pull them out. The remnants of that fish where are still there. I'm sure Chester Creek probably somewhere there has a very similar type of thing. The other thing I like is when I look at some of these larger points here from Chester, and when you look at some of the size of these points, many of these points would have been for things that we think of as like um, deer. Many of these smaller points would have been for rabbit, squirrel, but these larger points here would have been for bear, all of these. So again, these tell us a whole story about what the Native Americans were hunting, what their daily life was like. One of the pieces I really like in the collection because it's so small and so unnoticeable is this little piece of flint right here. And that particular piece of flint would have been used by a Native American, probably very well would have been carried like in his strap right here, like we would think of as, as, as you know, in your belt. And when you look at the little jagged edges there, this would have been once something was caught, such as a, a squirrel or, or something small like a rabbit, this would have been used to skin it, scrape out it, scrape it out, scrape the fur, and then um, gut it. Uh, very neat piece. Most pieces like this people don't realize are Native American. Let's take this very piece here and we can look closely at the sides and we can see the way the sides have been worked by the Native American right here along the edges. Here also. This piece right here, I can tell you at some point probably matched right up with this piece here. This piece was actually found when Route 9 was built. And when Route 9 was built, they came across right on the Chester Deep River line, they came across the very spot where the Native Americans worked their implements, where someone sat and made them. So you can even hold this in your hand, and that's the best way to figure out a Native American artifact. Hold it in your hand. You can hold it, it fits so perfectly just one way. You can see how gouged it is, and you can just imagine that Native American working the piece to get it just right, whether it be this piece here, or many of these pieces here. I'm gonna show you a few other pieces here that I think tell us an awful lot about our Native Americans. And these are these items right here. What you can see here is you can see a hammer, small hammer. If you look closely, you can see the little, where a notch, where a, a pole of some sort would have been. You can see the great wear marks that would have held that into place. We have a hammer there. We have a small ax right here. We might think of it as a hatchet. We have a much larger axe here, a beautiful piece there. You can just see, uh, in this particular case, a small, a small hatchet here would have not required a tremendous amount of force. An axe would have, so this would have been notched into a large post, a large you know, a handle. Top here would have been where your sinew would have held it into place. This would have been for felling trees. Now why are these so important for us? Because the Native Americans lived in wigwams. And this is what they would have used to fell the trees for those wigwams, to hammer the poles into place. I mentioned earlier the fact that they encamped on top of Fort Hill or Pataconk Hill in Chester. But you can imagine that encampment would have been their main encampment, but there were dozens, if not hundreds of Native Americans living up and down the River Valley. So they would have stretched all out into Chester. So you can just imagine today if you could picture this in your mind, East Kings Highway, going up 154, 
all the way up through Castle View, Denlar Drive, all the way up. It was probably covered with wigwams at the time as the Native Americans encamped there. My own family lived, you know, for decades down on the Connecticut River, right on the Haddamtown line. There was a lot of evidence of Native Americans in that area, and a lot of artifacts were found over time. But here's what's interesting about the Native Americans. The English talked to us about the fact that in Chester there were two Native American encampments. They had the fort and all the wigwams around that, but they also talk about a winter encampment. I'm not sure it was actually a winter encampment as much as it was just another encampment, but it was out by what we know today as Cedar Lake. And as a matter of fact, if you go out towards Cedar Lake today and just before you get to Camp Hayes and there's a beautiful colonial yellow house on the right, known as the Howe Tavern. Right there, that was known as Wigwam Hollow. And as a matter of fact, if you go over, when the early settlers came, they traveled out there over what we know today as Wig Hill Road. And Wig Hill Road derives its name from the fact that that road came out right at Wigwam Hollow, thus the name. So the Native Americans would be there, they'd be down at the other um, end by the river. Another book I love in the collection of the Chester Historical Society is this very slim volume. It was written by a man named Edward Hungerford. Edward Hungerford was in the Warner family. The Warner family are the, is the very family that started the Chester Ferry in 1764, um, also very involved in trade. And in the 1890s, he wrote a wonderful book called Pataconk and Its Indians. And the reason I like this book so much, not only is it a it's a little bit of a sentimental account of the Wangunks, but he gives tremendous detail of these Wangunks and Chester. Now, we have to ask ourselves, how did he know so much? Well, Jonathan Warner, his ancestor, is the very man who bought Fort Hill from uh, the Native Americans. He's the man who lived there, developed that whole area. Um, in this particular book, Robert or Edward Hungerford actually talks about his grandfather playing amongst the remains of the Palisado Fort on Fort Hill. So it's a great book that gives us probably the best account we have of these Wangunks from the family stories and the family lore that comes down. One of the things he mentions in here is the fact that when they were putting in the road to the Chester Ferry, they came across skeletal remains at the base of the hill. And those skeletal remains were not in a traditional burial format. It obviously had been an attack on the fort and these were the Native Americans that had died in the process. So we can imagine there were attacks. Our Wangunks were a friendly group, but they obviously were threatened. This brings me to a couple of pieces that come to us from the collection, and it's these two here that I actually love. Um, I'm not sure if this is the exact uh, case with these points, but when you look at a piece like this, and you can see where there must have been a pole at one time, you can see where the sinew would have come over the top to hold it in place, you can see it's worn, but yet it's not a hammer. Because a hammer, this is, this is Portland sandstone, you know, brownstone. This would have broken to pieces. I'd often like to think that this probably was some sort of a defensive weapon. We might call it a tomahawk of some sort. Same with this one here. This is a beautiful piece that was found right on the river um, north of Fort Hill. Beautiful piece you can see with the flecks in the black stone. You can imagine the way this sat in a pole right here with the sinew, you can see the wear part of the sinew. But when you look at it, it's not a hammer. There's no way that's a hammer with that point coming down. It's not damaged whatsoever. Chances are also this probably also was a war weapon of some, uh, uh, you know, of some degree. The other thing I wanted to mention that, that Edward Hungerford talks about in this little slim volume is our sweating pits. And in the case of sweating pits, the English talk about sweating pits being on top of Fort Hill. But there were also sweating pits along the river. And what a sweating pit was, was a large hole in the ground, stone lining in the bottom. And what the Native Americans would do is when someone was sick and they couldn't cure them, they would sweat them and they would take rocks, put them into a fire till they were real hot, put those in the bottom, put bear, uh, bear or deer skin on top, put the individual on top, cover them with more skins and sweat it out. And then they would plunge them into the river. 
So in this particular case, Robert Hungerford or Edward Hungerford actually talks about that in his book. I've actually seen a sweating pit. It's kind of it's kind of neat. Mary Nolenberg had a the Nolenbergs had a home on Parker's Point. Friends of my grandparents and my grandmother used to always tell me about the sweating pit that was in Mary and Bernard Nolenberg's front yard. Um, Noli used to bring my grandfather to it and show it to him. So at one point, I called Mary Nolenberg and Noli was long gone, her husband, and I said, you know, Mary, I'd like to see that sweating pit. And she took me into that front yard and she said her husband had filled it with sand, but right there on the edge of the river, you could see the circular pit. Um, and she said at the very bottom of that pit, it had been lined by stones. So it's a great example right there of the actual sweating pit. When I think about that sweating pit in the front yard of the Nolenberg house on Parker's Point, it often reminds me of another thing that Mary Nolenberg showed me when I was down at her house some 35 years ago now. And that is the fact that when we drive around Chester today, we see that the town owns four cemeteries, the Catholic Church has one. But people don't realize that there was actually six, there are actually six cemeteries in Chester. And one of those, the very first burial ground, is right down at Parker's Point. Now why Parker's Point? Well, because that is where the English were so easily able to disembark as they started to settle Chester. The location was perfect. And that was the focal point early on. And they put their first burying ground right in her yard as you pull in in 1717. In the, in the years that followed from 1717 to 1736, there's about 25 English buried there. 1736, 37, they built what we know today as the old burying ground and they stopped burying people English there. But what the English did is they would not allow the Native Americans to bury their dead out amongst the woods anymore. So they put, made them be buried with the English. So we know that down at that burying ground at Parker's Point, besides the 25 English, there are probably most likely a number of Native Americans. Why do we know that? Because in the old burying ground, in the corner, there are a number of Native Americans very early on buried. You can see them because they're just simple pieces of field stone sticking up to mark the graves of names that are long since forgotten. So every time I come to the Chester Historical Society at this beautiful museum at the mill, I stop and pause. I stop and pause at this exhibit on Native Americans. I hold them in reverence. I'm, I'm just amazed and I often wonder what life was like before the white man came. And I think the collection of the Chester Historical Society tells us just that. Thank you very much.